So this morning, uh, we're, we're kicking off with the first talk in the, the cities theme. And as I've mentioned, uh, future cities, network cities, smart cities, uh, this is a, a theme that Future Everything's been engaged in really for a long time, ever since we started working in sort of digital media outside on the street. Really, as, as soon as we started playing with mobile, you know, sort of over 10 years ago, we started rubbing up against issues, you know, that architects and urban planners were thinking about. And it's been a really key, key theme for us. And we found that right now there's some really big debates out there, there's some big issues that need, need to be solved, need to be worked out. Um, a lot of the smart city agenda you'll be hearing over the next two days, it's not, not quite working. It's missing a few fundamental points and principles. And some of those we're going to hear about under the, under the banner of the smart citizen, for example. And tomorrow there's going to be a key debate led by Anthony Townsend, uh, looking at bespoke, bespoke smart cities, or, or is that made to measure? Um, so first, to, to kick off uh, the summit, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Dan Hill. Um, Dan Hill is someone who uh, we've known for a long, long time, uh, about 17 years. Um, and Dan's had an incredible career which really exemplifies our I won't say meandering, our roaming, roaming interests. Um, Dan's worked um, uh, uh, at the BBC, uh, was involved in, in iPlayer, design of iPlayer. Worked at Arup, uh, doing really key work at Foresight and Innovation around, uh, around cities. Uh, headed up the, uh, an innovation agency in, in Scandinavia um, and is now CEO at Fabrica. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Dan Hill. Uh, Dan Hill, who's lost his voice this morning, just in time to give a keynote speech. So I'm sounding more like Lee Marvin than I usually do. Um, so bear with me. I'll try and get through this as best I can. <coughs> it might add some much needed gravitas to my speech. I don't know, but we'll see. Uh, so thanks, Drew and Lou, for inviting me. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is this kind of thing, uh, perhaps missing from the smart city debate. Um, and it struck me that I do have a bit of meandering history here. It's absolutely meander meandering. Not, it's not planned at all. And uh, about 18, mm, 19 years ago, I used to work here on Tip Street in Manchester, number 70, which is now a boutique beer shop downstairs, but um, upstairs we started something called the Northern Quarter Network, which was uh, kind of a drop-in center for local businesses where we could take them into a room with four Apple Macs in it and two 56K modems, I think, and we showed them the internet. <laughs> it was like, well, it's one of those times when you used to go to a room to look at the internet, you know? <laughs> and, um, and we worked with local businesses to help them understand whether it would be any good or not, is it gonna catch on? because you weren't quite sure. I mean, we thought it would, but you weren't quite sure. <coughs> we ended up building websites with local businesses. Um, and I think that when I met Drew, actually, is when I, I think I built the first Future Sonic website. I can't remember. I think I did uh, a long time ago. So, uh, so there is this history in my work, anyway, of working with citizens and the city and bottom-up networks around neighborhoods. Um, which is quite different to a lot of the smart city rhetoric that you'll see around cities generally, which tends to be rather more uh, top-down, government-based, um, and maybe large IT company-based, and I'll talk about that a bit more. Manchester itself, of course, has a long history of defining a new kind of city. And uh, I mentioned this last night, what a cliche it is to talk about that, so I'm particularly not going to do that now, now that I have no voice. But it was, a, it was a shock city, it defined a new world. And one, it's one of the handful of cities then, we can say over the last 20,000 years that have done this. Um, the question now is, what kind of city is it gonna define now in an age when we can do this kind of thing? I should argue it's not a great idea, to be honest. Uh, sorry if anybody in the room did that, but... Um, this is one of Ma Manchester's best buildings in the city centre, and uh, having, uh, having the advert stuck on the end of it like that doesn't really do a lot for it, and it doesn't really do a lot for me. I can't do anything with it. 
uh, it's nothing really more than an imposition in a way. So smart cities has to mean a lot more than uh, just digital at large in the city. So um, because I'm English, I'm, c I'm comfortable talking about failure. And uh, I'll outline a few of the things that I've been involved with, which didn't really happen, actually, for various reasons. Uh, the first of these was something called the Cloud, which was a proposal for the London Olympics that I worked on when I was at Arup, um, working with MIT uh, and a bunch of others. And the idea was that it would sit above the Olympic Stadium for this year's Olympics, or last year's Olympics. And it would be an observation deck that you could walk up and go in, essentially. You might remember that the um, Anish Kapoor won, actually, this with Cecil Belmond. It was the red structure that was next to the Olympic Stadium. Um, ours was somewhat different in that it intended to be a display, both inside and outside. So at the top, you could climb in and look through it, but you could also project onto it. In fact, it was actually not so much projection as having LEDs embedded throughout it. So lights were embedded in it. This is what it would feel like as you were <coughs> moving up in and around the space. And then at the top, of course, it would be uh, essentially a giant 3D display. So we thought we might use that as a kind of a smart meter, but about London. So how is London doing? What's the data we can draw from London and the Olympics in real time? And how do we work with that in and around this structure as a civic scale feedback device? So not an individual scale, which is often where this uh, debate is located around mobiles, which are very individual, but actually something that would be shared by um, neighborhoods for miles around, potentially. Um, within it, you could kind of look back onto London and see data projected onto London. So it sort of worked two ways. Um, it didn't win. <laughs> it came second. Apparently it was the mayor's favorite, but when the mayor is Boris Johnson, that's a bit of a poison chalice to... Mm. <laughs> Um, nonetheless, it didn't win for various reasons. The uh, second one is a similar idea in Australia. A university building that would display what's going on on the outside, what's going on on the inside of the building. So it would tap into data networks in the inside the building and pull them onto the outside. So you get a sense of what the building is doing and what the university is doing in real time. So you can see there's a PhD class going on up here. These are the number of bikes left in the bike garage downstairs, there's a uh, co-working space available here, there's energy patterns and so on. This is based on the idea that buildings are very, very opaque, actually. They, you don't often know what's going on inside them. I'm trying to find this place this morning, I'm sure most of you struggled in a way because you wouldn't know that this was going on inside. But you, there's probably enough data in the room now to convey some kind of story about what's happening here and the strange gravelly voice man at the front. Um, that's all there on Twitter. So what if we could feed that out onto the street in some way? Would that help define the place, perhaps? That didn't win either. So anyway, you'll see a pattern emerging. Um, this is Barangaroo in Sydney, which we did win, uh, with uh, Roger Stirk Harbour, Richard Rogers, um, at, when I was at Arup. That was largely about the same kind of idea, but playing out the data across the civic scale, across the neighborhood. This probably is happening, but it's difficult to say. Now it's incredibly difficult to get these ideas over the line that you might pull data from the urban environment back into the urban environment in a very open public way at large scale like this, but also a small scale, um, you know, on tiny displays on lampposts as well as the big media screens you've seen. Um, and you'd have also these, you know, this is reusing an old industrial bit of architecture, giant sort of civic scale smart meters uh, that, that is not built into the way that most building projects happen. You'll be surprised to learn. Mazda in Abu Dhabi um, is happening again, but it's a very different kind of project. You never quite know with Mazda. I don't know what that is. Interesting. Interesting. Invisible forces. Um, because uh, my phone's over there, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Mazda and Abu Dhabi, we, the idea here was to work in the piazza in the central square and to use these lighting pods designed by lava, um, which gathered energy during the day from the sun and then closed up at night to let the, the heat rise up uh, into the, the night sky. 
And these would also be LEDs, lighting displays, so you could actually use the whole thing to play out then across the plaza. Again, what's, what's happening in the square? When's the light rail, which is on the top right there, about to arrive? You could have the, the lights move across the piazza, kind of like the water breaking on the bow of a ship, just before the light rail turns up. So you're announcing events in the urban environment. Sydney Metro is my most spectacular failure. Um, so this was, this was cancelled after about two years of work and probably about, I don't know, 500 million Australian dollars spent on it because there was a change of premier and the premier of New South Wales didn't want it and the, new, the incoming one, the previous one, had. But again, after two years of design time on it, our idea was how do you use data to convey what's going on again on the metro in real time? Where are the trains? Where are the people? Which bit of the train is busy or not? You can tell all of that actually by... Uh, looking at the patterns of digital activity going on and around. So this poor guy trying to work at a station, clearly not designed for that. Um, this guy trying to work on a metro train, <laughs> clearly not designed for that. So part of our thought was, well, how do we design trains and stations to take into account that this might be happening? Um, but also, what can we tell from looking at these devices? They're not trying to draw data from them, just sense their presence in some way, just as we might actually usually they count people in stations in a number of different ways with this we get much finer grain so my colleague jason mcdermott uh, built this visualization which showed um which you can't really see very well sorry more or less so these are the traces left by cell phones as they're walking around sydney just actually just looking at bluetooth now you can look at bluetooth and wi-fi and a number of other things and you get a sense of actually the individual phone, which is quite scary in a way from a data protection, privacy, anonymity point of view. So I was told Jason off for leaving the actual phone ID on this visualization, but then uh, I'm displaying it to you, so I'm just as bad. <laughs> but you get this incredibly rich data about the way people are using the city, which we've never had before. We've never had this fine grained data on how people might move through it. So it seemed incredibly interesting to then build devices which you could attach to places. This was one, a, a discrete one we built. Actually, we designed them to be very noticeable. So you could know that you were being uh, sniffed, essentially, uh, or your phone was. And then we would display the data this large in, in the station itself. So that would be a real-time moving map of Sydney Metro on the right there. Again, showing congestion patterns, what's running, what isn't, how it connects to other services, and so on. Same thing at touch screen level, and then the same thing on your mobile as well. Uh, people aren't used to thinking about that in infrastructure projects, funnily enough. The same data at different scales runs across three, four different procurement contracts. Um, so the instinctive approach that a website designer might take to it is just not the done thing in that kind of business. So that also is incredibly difficult to get at. I'll show you a few things that were behind that sketching really this was projects we did at university of sydney where i taught um on the side a bit and that's uh celia johansson who is a student there, who built this great installation in the street um so you can see there's a lot of gaffer tape involved uh and then a very simple light sensor above the pedestrian crossing that's the button you press to signal to the traffic light that you'd like to cross the road of course half the time they don't really do anything but don't tell anybody that um, then she slightly illegally taped um, this sensor to the traffic light itself so she could see when it was green or red. And with these two data points, the people pressing the button and then the frequency of the traffic light, she then made a Twitter feed for the lamppost itself or for the, for the traffic light called Lonely Traffic Light, which might still exist as a Twitter feed, I'm not sure. Um, which then she gives some character to it. So she, there was some very simple code detecting how busy it was and then it would it would sort of stress out basically it would say if people were pressing the button too much it would begin to freak out and if there was too much traffic it would also freak out and then she um, made uh, a speech to text or no text to speech converter and we'll see if we can can we get some sound for this just make sure it's working yeah So 
So she made this short movie basically about this. And this is so simple to make, you know, this is um, 50 bucks worth of electronics, if that. I'm just going to skip ahead a bit. So people love this thing. Um, they would probably love it less after two days. <laughs> and uh, the idea here wasn't to suggest that we should make traffic lights that talk back to you. It was actually to ask the question, is that a good idea or not? Because we can kind of make the technology do anything now. Um, so the question is, what should we do? Is it a good idea, actually, to have the infrastructure be smart in this way? And probably not, but um, there is something interesting there. Maybe it would be fun for a day or two to have the city's infrastructure talk back to you in that way. There's another project that Jesse did, another student. Again, uh, she built these very unobtrusive-looking chairs um, by a bus stop. Same place, across the road, actually. And uh, she built this lovely and simple installation. So it goes like this. Someone sits on one of these chairs at the bus stop, waiting for the bus. Scroll forward a bit. Somebody sits on the chair next to them, and the chairs automatically swing round and point you towards each other. <laughs> so they kind of uh, force you to talk, force you to interact. So this is also really nice because it's, you know, again, it's just sensors, it's sensors detecting someone sitting. She built, I think it's actually a washing machine motor to turn the chairs. Um, it's really, really basic, but it's, I like it because, again, it's asking the question, is that a good thing to do? Is that socially acceptable? In what cultures is that socially unacceptable? You know, is that, that might be okay in Manchester, I don't know, I mean, probably not in London. <laughs> so... And, it, and certainly not in Helsinki. But, and I'm probably Seoul, I don't know where Jesse is from. But, um, so, you know, it, it was kind of, it's sort of interesting. And then it, it points you back towards the bus when the bus is coming, by the way, to remind you that's why you were there in the first place. But, again, we can, we can make the, the technology do anything now. So the question is, what do you do? Uh, what's the right thing to do? And I like these because they're subtle and they play with um, etiquette. They play with social mores. They play with culture. So, but back to my point, in the, those failures I showed you, why didn't they work? And uh, I have worked on some successful projects, just to be clear. <laughs> um, so the BBC, we were able to uh, swing the thing around, really, to point at the internet in a useful way. Um, because we were on the in inside, a whole bunch of us working very hard, maybe 10 years ago, um, in more or less in the right positions, with a lot of hard work to try and get in the right positions, were able to, to reorient it from the inside. You couldn't do that, actually, from the outside, I think. Um, but w we managed to do that. And then the State Library of Queensland, later on, many years later at Arup, I managed to work with them quite strategically on what a library should be in the 21st century. They had this beautiful open building, but the interesting thing to them was people actually coming here and doing this. That's um, a French software engineer working for a Canadian company over the free Wi-Fi from Australia. And they had no idea this kind of activity would go on. And you had no way of knowing that unless I happened to be there doing um, basically a post-occupancy evaluation on the Wi-Fi itself, trying to understand what was going on with the internet meeting this physical space in a place around knowledge and information. This was at 6 o'clock in the morning. That previous one was 11 o'clock at night. It was basically all open. And because it's Brisbane, you can hang outside uh, a lot of the year. So it was, it was fascinating seeing how people adopted the building using this stuff in a new way, in a time when people were saying, ah, oh, the library will be dead because it's all on Wikipedia and Google. Absolutely nonsense. This was library figures going up massively, continue to do so. They went from 200,000 visitors a year to 1.2 million visitors a year, partly through the new building, but partly it came with public Wi-Fi. And people were coming from... Uh, in some cases, 50, 60 kilometers around to come here and use it because it was the nicest place to use the internet. They had it, the internet at home, but this was a nicer place to do it, a social place that they could 
adapt in their own way. It was because it was a public space. And then, of course, you get into all the problems about, well, it wasn't designed for that, actually. So there's people daisy-chaining power connections <laughs> off the cleaner's power socket, you know. So we help with them rebuild the library with, with that in mind. And then understand what, you know, what, what these three girls might be doing. Are they using Facebook? Are they using Photoshop? I mean, no way of knowing. So how would you engage with that was a very interesting idea. How do you build that into the library? Then when we came to extending that work on the edge, then we were strategically positioned to rethink it from the inside. So I did a lot of early sketches on how does a building end up with a, with a public display onto the river? How do we, uh, this is furniture we designed, which could be a stage or individual seating units, but that, that thing at the back there can be packed full of sensors. So it becomes something that again is part of the toolkit of the building and the story of the building, not just a chair as well as the design of the spaces, as well as the design of the coffee shop, the uniforms or not, you know, all of these questions. Um, they're all part of working with digital in inside physical, because they're now the same thing. You can't separate them. Either way, you have to redesign the context. You can't just work from that as a designer or a consultant and follow the brief, actually. You have to redesign the brief and actually change the organization, ultimately. If it's a transformative product, you have to transform the organization. There's no two ways about it. And the internet is one of those things that transforms you if you don't transform with it. So, so it becomes strategic. And the key point on the failures is that the ideas aren't the big deal, actually. It's easy to have ideas. Um, some of those that I showed you are good ideas, some are clearly bad, but um, you can decide. Either way, they weren't enough to get up. It was something else that was missing there. And there was that sense of actually, well, why are they there in the first place? Um, and as the great British architect Cedric Price said in the mid-60s, mid technology is the answer, but what's the question? And he said this maybe like 50 years ago. I still don't think we've really thought about this one enough. Um, we jump on technology as a solution without stepping back to think, well, what are we trying to do in the first place? And this is the issue with smart cities. What, what, why smart? What, what's smart about it? What kind of city do we want at the other end of it? That's a much bigger question that we're not really having good conversations about. Part of the other issue is that as the designer, you see a very small chunk of the pie. Uh, Victor, Victor Papenek wrote this in 1984. Um, and it's clear that's often where you're working as a designer. You can't really get at the real problem. So hence the, the plea for involving yourself strategically again. So what's interesting here is this is all about decision making, actually. This is all about why do some things happen and why don't other things happen. In the context of the city, that's about politics, for want of a better word. Um, and when we're trying to change the cities to be more sustainable, for example, or dealing with aging population better, or any, any of the current problems we're facing, can we look to the institutions which created those problems <laughs> to also solve them? So can you look to the institutions which created a high carbon world to produce a low carbon world. It's kind of an odd thing, you know. Uh, so institutions themselves are now in a bit of crisis. And you can see this quite clearly in this country um, with the riots, which were the worst riots I can remember in my lifetime, my short lifetime. Um, some of this was Oldham Street, I think, which is not so far away. Um, which was clearly a massive breakdown, one way or another, between a government and its people. No matter how you dress it up, that was kind of one thing that was going on there. Interestingly, technology was implicated, in this case, BlackBerry Messenger. Um, I'd be very clear to say that was not a driver, it was an enabler, a tool, if you like. But absolutely wasn't the reason why the riots happened, despite what some people tried to say a couple of days later. And of course, the thing is that riots have happened for hundreds of years quite well without BlackBerry Messenger. Um, possibly better. <laughs> and uh, what hadn't happened, though, was a, a nationwide self-organized mass cleanup of the riots the day after, organized over Twitter. That had never happened before in human history. So social media, you know, got a bad rep at the time. It should have got a good rep um, in many respects. The, the, but the real problem was somewhere else. Just as the real problem, this is Occupy, this is Occupy Rome, of course, which is a much more visceral thing than you see in many other cities, Rome being Rome. Um, 
the Occupy movement, in some senses, enabled by Twitter, but driven by very different things. And what's interesting is that these are urban conditions. This is a combination of the piazza, or in Occupy's case, uh, Zuccotti Park, originally, a, a public square or a semi-public square, and social media together. So the piazza and social media together is what enables this to happen, uh, just as with the riots, because we don't really have piazzas in the UK, um, despite attempts, you know. Uh, we have high streets, so that's where it happens. You know, the high street is our piazza to some extent. That's how much we like shopping. Um, in uh, the Arab Spring, this is Tahrir Square, same thing, but this time Facebook, actually, it was probably more relevant. Uh, Facebook and the, the square, Tahrir Square, is what enabled, to some extent, Arab Spring, but it's driven by something entirely different. Poverty, disenfranchisement, the same things that have driven riots for centuries again. Those are the real drivers. Uh, this is Athens. You know, I could keep on going with this um, litany of institutional collapse, but I don't want to do that and make you all cry. Uh, the Eurozone crisis is clearly, that's what's going on there. So what's interesting is, as my former boss at Citra used to say, the Finnish Innovation Fund, we're struggling because we have 18th century institutions trying to deal with 21st century problems. The problems we're facing, climate change, aging population, uh, healthcare, food um, crises, um, educational crises, fiscal policy, they're, they're all 20, distinctly 21st century problems. The institutions we have are largely 18th century, maybe 17th in some cases, 19th in others, and they've been brushed up since then, but at core, that's what they are. So no wonder there's a problem. In Italy, where I live now, politics is an interesting thing. Um, so this is the institution that runs the country there. Uh, and of course, there's a 6% of trust of government in the populace, it's completely broken. So what was interesting recently, I don't know if you saw this, but in Italy, the party that won the most votes in the recent election was run to some extent by this guy, Beppe Grillo, who's a former comedian, the Five Star Movement, and um, this is him in my hometown, actually. It, it's fascinating, because what, why they won the most votes, and this trying to form a government one way or another, was through breaking all the rules because the system was broken. The institution had collapsed, so they refused to appear on mainstream media, nothing. They, none of their representatives appeared on the Italian equivalent of Newsnight or Six O'Clock News or spoke to the Italian equivalent of The Guardian or The Daily Mail. No engagement whatsoever. They didn't buy any advertising, so no billboards, nothing on TV. They said, we're not having any of that. That is all broken. <laughs> And they did social media and the piazza again. So they went on this tour of city to city, night after night. That was in Treviso. In Rome, they culminated with 250,000 people out in the, in the streets of Rome in the piazza. And the rest of it was all online. And so in a major Western democracy, um, 60 million people, you know, the same as UK. Imagine that, a, 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 a political party not appearing on telly at any point in the election campaign and not doing, spending a single euro on advertising and winning the most votes. So there's something going on here, and it's playing out again on social media and the piazza, this kind of combination of those things. Of course, your future prime minister um, <laughs> represents another kind of institutional breakdown of a kind. You know, and, it, and we wonder why, again, there's declining interest in politics. And the thing is, you know, <laughs> Boris is quite adept at this. <laughs> As you can see, you're laughing now. <laughs> um, but uh, another story uh, from Helsinki. This is um, a skate sculpture, a sculpt of public artwork commissioned by the city council um, and being put in place in uh, an urban regeneration site, basically, a kind of a, um, a sunken tunnel through the, through the city centre. It was commissioned for skaters to skate upon, that's why it looks like it does. It says Helsinki. It's not very nice, actually, but anyway, it's not for me. Um, and this thing launched, and then uh, two weeks later, uh, there were lots of complaints from the people either side about the noise of the skaters skating on the skate sculpture, um, because there are apartment blocks either side of this thing. And so the city council sent out, I'll just play that again, not that. Um, 
sent out their public works department to dig a trench around the skate sculpture to stop the skaters skating on the skate sculpture. So, so the city was vandalizing its own project, basically. One, one arm had commissioned it, the public art bit, another arm, direct works, had been sent out to basically dig this trench around it. That's what's happening. Um, because there were complaints. Now, of course, two weeks later, there were complaints about the complaints. And, uh, and so what this is actually a movie, of, and my colleague and I happen to be there, is the poor public works guys being sent out to fill in the trench that they dug two weeks before. So they're putting asphalt, asphalty in Finnish, um, back in to the thing that they just dug up. So, you know, you've got to feel for the public works guys, but on the other hand, I kind of also feel for the city council a little bit. I mean, it clearly it was ridiculous, almost um, psychotic behavior. But how many complaints is enough to send out the diggers or not? I mean, we just don't know the answers to these questions now. Of course, they should have involved the residents in the commissioning of the work in the first place. We know that, but it doesn't happen often, as you know. And then now people can organize very quickly using the internet to complain effectively. Um, how many is enough? Is it 500? Is it 1,000 complaints? Is it two? Two very important complaints? I don't know. And then how many complaints do you need to then go out and fill the trench back in again? We just have no answers to these questions now. So what is an institution supposed to do? It's interestingly in Helsinki, there's um, completely the other end of the scale, there's a bottom-up networked initiative called Ravintola Piva, which means restaurant day. What's happening here is a woman is lowering egg and bacon muffins from her first floor window to the grateful crowd below who are putting uh, three euros or five euros, maybe it's five actually, Helsinki is quite expensive, into the basket and she lifts it up and then she, she gives you an egg and bacon muffin that she's made in her kitchen of the apartment. And this is illegal basically because she doesn't have a license to make an egg and bacon muffin. I have to say it's very difficult to get egg and bacon in Helsinki. This is a major innovation in the city. <laughs> There's a huge public value. Um, the reason this happened is because it's very difficult to set up a small cafe or to set up a street food business in Helsinki. The regulations around food hygiene and safety are incredibly high, much higher than they need to be, actually, higher than the EU needs them to be. But it had been built with a certain kind of street food in mind, and Helsinki was diversifying. This was actually an English woman, hence the egg and bacon muffin. Um, and so what happened was that a bunch of people were, got, were so annoyed about not being able to set up the cafe, they said, I saw it. Well, let's start something called Restaurant Day. We'll call it a day. We'll organize it on Facebook. If we all open our little kind of pop-up at the same time, what are they going to do? They can't arrest us all. And that's what happened. So this is actually, this is a street around the corner, an Argentinian woman living in Facebook, lowering empanadas that she's made in her kitchen. That's my son about to get hit on the head. Um, and that's, that's a human empanada in the foreground there. Uh, so it's like, it's an amazing day because suddenly you realize, oh my, there's an Argentinian woman there, I had no idea. And you can get an empanada, which you can't get anywhere else. And the streets come alive and the parks come alive. This is um, someone's set up a Thai soup kitchen in a park around the corner from where I lived. And you can see how wonderful this is. You know, it becomes this festival of street food, the street, Helsinki itself. It's all totally illegal. <laughs> the city has nothing it can do about it, though, because it's organized on Facebook by basically a bunch of shadowy individuals, which then has become a movement. There's nothing to arrest. It's a set of instructions, and you can't arrest a set of instructions. You know, there's... And they clearly can't drive around in a van and try and scoop this into the back of your van. And it'd be just the worst PR disaster imaginable. So, so this happens now. There are 400 of these pop-ups going on simultaneously. It spreads to numerous other cities. You can get food that you can't get usually. So it's this amazing thing again about a networked organization and how it can um, sidestep effortlessly bureaucracy. I have to say, this, this kiosk is not in use almost the entire year because to take out a lease on the kiosk, you have to take out the lease for two years, which no one is really... If, you're, if, you're a, you know, if you've got half an idea, maybe I can sell coffee from there or maybe I can sell sushi from there, make it tougher. Um, you're not going to take out a lease for two years on a hunch. You, know, you need a way of trying it out. What Ravis Restaurant Day enables them to do is basically prototype your idea, try out your hunch. Only 5% of the people that really do restaurant day actually will end up opening any kind of restaurant, I'm sure, because they realize what bloody hard work it is. 
but it's still good. It's a kind of a way of learning. And just to be clear, this isn't about getting falafels on street corners or sushi or empanadas. Because when you look at food, of course, you're looking across numerous systems of daily life. Carbon, logistics, agriculture, waste. What kind of service culture do you have? Diversity. You saw, again, how diverse Helsinki was. That's new. That hadn't been the way 10 years ago. And the city was still running with the old idea of Helsinki in mind. So what it's about is understanding what public space can be, what it can do for the city, and who decides what public space is about. Who's to say whether I can open an empanada stall there or not? The city is clearly involved, but what's the way to have the conversation? That's a different matter. So this idea of active citizens becomes important. I actually prefer active to smart. I don't really like the word smart. But active, engaged citizens. This is in Berlin, where the residents of Schoenberg um, put, uh, they look after the planter boxes in their street. Again, it's actually probably illegal. The city council should be doing this work, but they don't because they don't have enough money. So the citizens took it upon themselves. And it's beautiful, you know, it's just, it's, you get this lovely pattern effect because every apartment block has different people in it. So every block has different things outside. I mean, look at that, what a great planter box. <laughs> There's only one way to do this kind of thing and that's in this networked way now, I think, actually. Let's be clear though, this is very hipsterish. As I've talked about street food and planter boxes, they are entirely irrelevant in a way. Um, so we have to be careful when we talk about bottom-up networked things because we could get distracted by you know, crowdfunding planter boxes whilst there's big decisions being made about light rail or major public buildings or a new library or not, all going through the, the traditional institutional approach. So my plea is to bind those together, actually. We can't just do the bottom up. We can learn a lot from the way that that works, but we can't do it alone. But what's clear from an institutional point of view is the government now has competition. In terms of organizing and deciding, citizens can now do an awful lot themselves using new tools, which they just couldn't do before effectively. They couldn't scale it before in the same way. Like I said, you couldn't scale a cleanup after the riots in the same way before social media. It wouldn't actually be possible, I think. Just like restaurant day wouldn't actually be possible in the same way, and it certainly wouldn't spread globally. So government now has competition. Restaurant day is organized on Facebook, um, but they also built within two days in a hackathon four amazing mobile apps across the four major mobile platforms. Yeah, the four of them, not just the two, actually, which you would have to do, but they did the four. Um, which showed you where all the restaurants were popping up. Well, these are all pop-up restaurants on the left-hand side. And then it tells you where it is, what it is, as reviews and so on. They built that in two days. That's not how institutions can work currently. That was, that's entirely networked. When you look at how the institution works, and sorry to have a go at Helsinki again, this is what Helsinki City Council tries to put online when it says um, engage citizens in the future of the city. It's so bad, I can't even tell you. It just hurt my eyes to look at this thing. It was the worst thing I've seen on the internet in the last 10 years. And this isn't even the worst bit about it, but it, you know, it's just, it was just dreadful. It was followed up by a spreadsheet. So, and this is all in Finnish, but it might as well be in English for all, you know, you're, like, you're not gonna engage with it either way. And this was done by consultants for the city, entirely well-meaning. They want to know what Helsinki citizens think the city should be about. But this is the tools that they turn to, as opposed to this or this, which are entirely available off the shelf, basically. And this is Monoc you know, Monocle's uh, number one quality of life city, which I, I happen to write the article, but that doesn't matter. But it, it, they, they chose it in 2011. This isn't uh, a bad city, not a, this is a well-run city in many ways but they still do this. The problem is that, again, the network stuff doesn't scale, so the day after restaurant day, that kiosk I showed you snaps back to this. The city kind of snaps back to its condition it was in before, so pop-ups don't change anything, <laughs> I have to say. Temporary events, unfortunately, don't change things. They're not scalable, they're not systemic. They don't change what you need to change. So nothing pulls Raventilapaiva closer to the city to find this middle ground. So this is where we were doing the work we were doing in Helsinki was strategic design. So what we did was we um, made a thing called Open Kitchen, which was a cooking school 
It was actually not a cooking school, if you like. It didn't teach you how to cook. It taught you how to get around the regulations, how to access the regulations, who you need to talk to at the city to get your pop-up into a, a real thing. Um, how do you build something? How do you design it? How do you run a team? How do you get the bank to give you a loan? All of that stuff that they don't teach you in cooking school. and You don't know if you're a citizen. When we did a building project, again, we looked to see what difference can we make with the building. So we commissioned some German architects to do the building, but the idea was that let's build it mainly out of wood, the whole thing. You can build a building this big fully out of timber now. You don't need steel or concrete actually anymore. Cross laminate timber, which is this super dense pressed plywood basically. Um, you can make every single structural element, the whole thing out of wood. So it's way better from a carbon point of view. But of course, in Finland, where the Finland is 80% wood, uh, that's quite good for the forestry business because then they don't have to stop making toilet paper out of trees, but they can make construction materials, which are much higher value. And the toilet paper business is going down the toilet, as it were. So the, they could make something which is far more advanced. So I was fascinated by this idea about how do you get that done and how you can make a strategic systemic change. And a, a colleague, friend, Wouter Van Stifu, a Dutch architectural historian, came up with this great phrase, dark matter, to describe the work of institutions um, and structures. Uh, the things that you can't see, the things stopping you making the pop-up work. Now, in physics, uh, dark matter is 83% of the universe. <laughs> And it's the reason we're all, we can exist. And so the reason that matter can be is because we have dark matter. No one's ever seen it. We can't perceive it in any way. It's one of those physics things that just does your head in. Don't think about it too much. But it makes everything work. So I like the analogy because when it came to making the timber building, the reason we couldn't initially was because we found out the building codes said, you can't make a timber building of 12 stories. Because the building code had been written in the 19th century originally when it would have been crazy to make any kind of building out of wood, really, of any scale, because it would have burned. This stuff doesn't burn, but they hadn't updated the building codes accordingly. So the building code was, had been updated a few times, but not about that key thing. So we actually, our lawyers then engaged with the city's lawyers to change the building code so that the timber building could happen. And now there are four wooden buildings going up across southern Finland. That was the single biggest design thing we ever did, change a line of law, which is a line of code, if you think about it. It's the code that produces the city to some extent. And we describe this as dark matter. You can't see it. You can't see the building codes as you're walking around, but you're constantly um, dealing with the effects of them. Just as there was the hygiene regulations and the leasing structure that was stopping this thing being used, Dark matter. As you walk past it, you can't see that. Why? I walk past it every day. Why can't I get a bloody coffee in this kiosk? And it turns out it was the leasing structure, which you know, took me a long time to figure that out. So when you're designing in this world, and smart cities is this as much as anything, you need to zoom backwards and forwards from matter to dark matter. You need to make the thing. You need to understand the conditions around it. In this case, understand what a building can be. Understand how we can use a building to say, in that case, to unlock the forestry business. That was a much bigger strategic deal for Finland than just one building. There's more about that there. I won't bore you about that. Strelka.com, there's a little book about it. What we also did on that low to no project, the building, is we worked with Experientia to design some so called smart systems for the inhabitants, which would basically um, advance smart meters that would help with their energy use and so on. We were trying to make a low carbon building. And this was really good work that Experientia did. Um, we then followed up with a bunch of physical, digital installations like a food delivery system that would tell you how the food miles associated with the food that you were buying. Uh, community notice boards, which were physical and digital at the same time. Uh, all of that's in a book. If you go to lotono.org, you can download that. So in a sense, that's smart city stuff as well. But what I liked about that, and I think what makes it different perhaps, is we had this idea of active, engaged citizens again. We didn't try to automate much there, actually, because if you automate stuff, people stop thinking about it. And if people stop thinking about things, it's not a good idea, I would argue. If we want people to think about carbon, don't make the lights go off automatically. <laughs> in this room when you leave, because people will stop thinking about it. We can turn the light off on the way out. We're, you know, it's entirely possible. We're quite a smart species, potentially. So I'm sure we can handle that. 
And yes, it might be more efficient to make the light go off automatically, but again, it stops us thinking about it. We're not engaged, and when we disengage, that's not a good idea, I think, if we want people to think about something like carbon. So, meanwhile, the smart cities world is going in another direction, I, I think. When I was at the Shanghai Expo in 2010, it's an amazing thing. It's full of Shanghai Expo-like stuff. This is the um, urban best practices area, as you can see in the background. Uh, it says a lot, this picture. <laughs> um, and this is the Coca-Cola Happiness Factory, which is an, uh, also says a lot. Of, but there's wonderful things about the Expo as well. It was, an, it was an extraordinary thing. There are buildings just with oil written on them, you know, just... <laughs> um, and then so great signs like that. But, <coughs> but while we were there, um, uh, we were looking at the rooms that Cisco and General Motors had done in particular, which were their smart city showcases. Now, this woman is a Cisco employee dressed up like a city employee in a fake urban control room. This is a very strange situation. There were four or five Cisco employees kind of acting as if they were running the city in this kind of uh, centralized urban control room. It was really, really odd for her as much as anybody. And then uh, what you saw in that was this movie um, of how your life will be transformed in the near future through smart city stuff. So I filmed this slightly surreptitiously, so sorry for the quality. Well, I guess I'll show you a couple of things, actually. Um, what you're seeing here is the, the city control room. This is a 3D model hologram of the city in the foreground, and there's kind of city council people moving stuff around in the city. And uh, it's just such an, you know, it's an, such an absurd fantasy. It's unbelievable. And then there's people in gate. Everything is digital everywhere, of course. And then there's, um, there's a major hurricane about the hit city, so they managed to kind of use their smart city model to orient the city so that everybody survives, which is okay. But there's one vignette where a kid is kind of running home and he can't get home in time and the hurricane's coming, so he goes, I'll go to my grandmother's house, which is in an apartment like 70 stories up. And then he goes, okay, I've got to get in to get out of the way of the hurricane. And then he goes to the front door and there's a, a front door entry system uh, with a kind of face recognition on his face that has to let him in through the front door. And of course it works and he gets in and he's safe because he goes into the apartment. But you know, just like my voice has failed as I'm about to give a keynote, that is the time that the front door entry system would not work. So this poor nine-year-old boy's body would have been dashed to pieces by the hurricane. You know, it's just, there's an alternative movie that shows the reality of smart city work. GM's was the same, but involved a lot of cars. Surprise, surprise. Um, like this. So, and it reminds me when we've done this before, when we've had infrastructure companies driving things a bit. Um, New Movement in Cities is a wonderful book from the mid 60s, but it's, it's really lovely, but it made lots of incorrect prophecies about the way we'll move around cities because it was driven basically by what transport can be. At the same time, people like GM, and I've got no particular beef with GM, they're good in many ways but they were lobbying the city of Los Angeles to take out their tram network, which was the biggest in the world at that point, the, the biggest tram network in the world. Um, and that was because they thought, well, if we build freeways instead, from GM's point of view, that's quite good, that's a lot of cars. <laughs> from the city's point of view, they actually thought that was the right thing to do as well. It turned out it wasn't. You know, this was one of the single biggest stupid decisions we've ever made as a race to reorganize cities around cars. You know, it's up there with the dinosaurs not figuring out how to look at a, a meteor coming. It's just, it's really, really not been a good thing. We're going to have to unpick this decision for about 100 years now. So uh, a guy in Australia has a nice phrase about this. It's, he calls these kind of cities the cities that cars built when we weren't looking. Um, the suburbanized city. This is actually Sydney. Uh, the problem was that we were looking. We were deciding to do that. Sydney used to be like this. The second biggest tramp network in the world was in Sydney. And this is in 1906. And just look at how beautiful the street is here in terms of the way people move in and out of it. It's this really beautiful ballet, as Jane Jacobs would have called it, of people moving in and off the street. It's completely fluid. There's no pedestrian crossings where you have to ask permission to cross and then wait. You can just move across because it's all moving at a certain pace. Horses are there, trams are there, people are there. You know, I don't get too misty-eyed about this because bubonic plague was just around the corner. But, but still, seriously, in 1906, they had an outbreak. But 
um, the city in many ways, in this respect, I'd argue, was much better. So can we not make the same mistake again, please? Let's not confuse drivers like technology with enablers, which is why the city is there. Let's not confuse uh, the fact that we can make something like the automobile with the idea of then reorienting the city around it. Now, technology that we have around the internet is incredibly powerful, but let's not confuse it with the reason why cities exist. We don't make cities in order to make buildings and infrastructure, or indeed technology. That's a side effect of making cities. We make cities to come together to create culture or commerce or conviviality, or I'd even argue, if you want to get philosophical, something, some higher public idea of people living together in cooperation. The idea of the city itself is an amazing thing, and for 40,000 years we've been building it, heading in this direction. Humanity has basically voted for cities. So how we do this, how we cooperate and live together is the single biggest question we have, I think, at this point. Um, there are other ways. I'm, I'm being asked to, to finish off, but I'll just finish with a couple of ideas here. So, Smart citizens, um, instead, involves active engagement of citizens. So this is, um, in Holland, a shared space system. It's an intersection. There are no traffic lights. There are no signs. It works because of that. If you add traffic lights and signs to this, it'll start creating accidents. This is the safest way to make an intersection, the data shows, actually. Take away, this is the guy that designed it, <laughs> Hans Mondermann. Um, if you take away um, people's ability to handle it themselves and work together in cooperation, it's incredibly dangerous. This, this works because people work together so that the cars slow down to the speed of the bikes and the, and the people and so on, where they can look each other in the eye. It's a, it's a system which rewards trust. And it's been designed, so it's not like we're saying, it's all hands off, it's just, um, you know, don't read this as in any way like neoliberal, free market, uh, citizens will figure it out for themselves. It takes a certain civic order to make this work. It takes Holland actually to make that work in particular. But that is the safest way to do it. Another way to engage citizens, look at the work in Constitucion after the earthquake in Chile, which flattened the city, and they, re, they replanned the city, the master plan for the city, in 90 days. Usually that takes, to give you a sense of it, eight, nine, ten years for a major urban plan. And they did that through involving citizens, not, not involving citizens, by involving citizens. So they designed a system um, based around massive levels of engagement and very intense collaboration and cooperation uh, run by these guys, Tironi. And it's extraordinary. They got a city plan out in 90 days that almost everybody had had some say in with something like 93% approval by building a structure downtown, pulling people together, holding debates every night, using social media a lot actively as well, I'd say. So again, the piazza and social media together. Um, there's a lot more there online about that, but I think I'll finish with this idea that um, if we're going to figure out what the smart city is about, we need to involve citizens in it. Citizens themselves won't do enough. As I said, Restaurant Day does not fix Helsinki's food. You need to engage in the dark matter of institutions to, to resolve that in any way, for it to become systemic. Think about the idea of what we want the city to be about. In that case, what do we want Helsinki's food culture to be about? In Berlin, what do we want the streets to feel like? With smart cities, how do we want our city to work? How do we want people to engage? As I've tried to make clear, the most interesting use of technology in the city now is from citizens themselves, with mobiles in their hands, on the streets, in piazzas. It's Occupy, it's Arab Spring. All of those things are massively interesting. It's worth noting, none of them have continued particularly and found a way of resolving anything. So we need the institution to come the other way as well, to rethink what they are, just we've, we had to redesign all kinds of organizations from the bottom up for the 21st century. We'll have to redesign those things and pull them together so that we have active engaged government, yes, active engaged citizens, yes, and focusing all the on time on the idea of what the city can be in the first place. And with that, we might end up with a much smarter city. Thank you very much.